Twelve broad bears there with yearling mule foals by their side, not yet broken in. I went to bring one of them over here and break him. They were astounded, astounded when they heard this, for they had made sure that Telemachus had not gone to the city of Milius. They thought he was only away somewhere on the farms, and was with the sheep, or with the swineherd. So Antinous said, Where did he go? Tell me truly, and what young men did he take with him? Were they freemen on his own, or bondsmen, for he might manage that too? Tell me also, did you let him have the ship of your own free will, because he asked you, or did he take it without your leave? I lent it to him, answered no one. What else could I do when a man of his position said he was in a difficulty, and asked me to override him? I could not possibly refuse. As for those who went with him, they were the best young men we had, and I saw a mentor on board as captain, or some god who was exactly like him, I cannot understand, for I saw a mentor here, I saw this morning, and yet he was then setting out for Pylos, no man, then went back to his father's house, but Antinous and Eurymachus were very angry. They told others to leave off lying, and to come and sit down along themselves. When they came, Antinous, son of Eurytheus, spoke in anger, his heart was black with rage, and his eyes flashed fire as he said, Good heavens, this voyage of Telemachus is a very serious matter. We had made sure that it come to nothing, but the young fellow has got away in spite of us and take a crew too. He was giving us trouble presently. May Zeus take him before he is full grown. Find me a ship therefore, and a crew of twenty men, and I will lie in front of him in the straits between Ithaca and Same, and he will then rue the day that he set out to try and get news of his father. Lest he speak, and others applauded his saying, and they all went them inside the buildings. It is not long hair, Penelope came to know the suitors were plotting for a man's servant Medon. Overheard them for the outside of our court, they were lying the seams of him and went to tell his mistress. As he crossed the threshold of her room, Penelope said, Medon, what have the suitors sent you here for? It is to tell the maids to leave the master's business and cook the dinner for them. I wish I may neither woo nor dine. Henceforward, neither here nor anywhere else, but let this be the very last time. For the ways you made to the son's estate, did not your fathers tell you when you were children how good Odysseus had been to them, never doing anything high handed nor speaking harshly to anybody. Kings may say things sometimes, and they may take a fancy to one man and dislike another, but Odysseus never did any unjust thing by anybody, which shows what bad hearts have had. And that there is no such thing as gratitude left in the world. Then Midon said, I wish, madame, that there were all that they are plotting something much more dreadful now. May heaven frustrate their design. They are going to try and murder Telemachus, as he is coming home from Pylos and Sparta, where he has been to great news of his father. Then Penelope's heart sank with him, and for a long time she was speechless. Her eyes filled with tears, and she could no utterance. At last, however, she said, Why did my son leave me? What business had he to go sailing off in ships that make long voyages over the ocean like sea horses? Does he want to die without leaving anyone behind him to keep up his name? I do not know, answered Madon, whether some god set him onto it, or whether he went on his own impulse to see if he could find out if he father was dead or alive. And on his way home, and he went downstairs again, leaving Penelope in an agony of grief. There was a bunch of seats in the house, but she had no heart for sitting on any one of them. She could only fling herself on the floor of her own room and cry, where all the maids in the house were old and young. The other grand and began to cry too, till at the end of transport with sorrow, she exclaimed, My dears, heaven has been pleased to try me with more affliction than any other woman of my age and country. First, I lost my very lion hearted husband, who every good quality under heaven, whose name was great, all over Hellas, and Mill Argus. And now my darling son is at the mercy of the winds and waves, without my having heard one word about his leaving home. You hussies, there was not one among you who would so much as send to give me a call after my death, though you all you very well knew when he was starting. If I had known he meant to take this voyage, he would have to give it up, no matter how much he was vent. Upon it, or leave me a course behind, one or other. Now, however, go, some of you call old Dolius, who was giving me my father on my marriage, and who my gardener beat him. Go at once and tell Raven Teleritus, who may be to hit upon some plan for enlisting public sympathy on our side, or against those who are trying to exterminate his own race, and that of Odysseus. Then the dear old nurse here said, You may kill me, madam, or let me live on you in your house, whichever you please, but I will tell you the real truth. I knew all about it, and gave him everything you wanted in the way of bread and wine, and he made me my solemn oath that I would not tell you anything for seven, ten, or twelve days, unless you asked what happened to you or having gone, for he did not want to spoil your beauty by crying. And now, madam, wash your face, change your dress, and go upstairs, and the maids and officers, Athena, to her pages bearing Zeus, or she can save him, though he be in the jaws of death. He trouble, Eritus. He has trouble enough already, besides, I cannot think of a god to take the race of the son. There are cases, so much better there will be a son left to come up after him, and inherit both the house and the fair fields that lie far around about it. With these words, she made her mistress leave off crying and dry the tears from her eyes. Penelope washed her face, changed her dress, and went upstairs with her maid. She then put some bruised barley into a basket and began praying to Athena. Hear me, she cried. Do not remember spelling the truth. But where will ever? Odysseus. While he was gone with your fat fire and her sheep, or I for there was a mine now and as my favor and saved the hour and some from the women of the suitors. She cried aloud as she spoke and the goddess heard her prayer. Meanwhile, the suitors were clamorous throughout the country cloister, and one of them said, The queen's are having her marriage with one of or other of us. Little does she dream that her son has now been boomed to die. This was what they said when they did not know what was happening. Then Hanson said, Comrades, let us be by the talk. Let us now some to be carried inside. Let us be up and do that in silence about which we are all of one mind. He then chose twenty men, and they went down to their ships to the seaside. They drew the vessel to the water and got her best. Sails inside her, they down the worst of those dolphins with twisted tongues and leather all in due course, and spread white sails aloft while their fine servants wrapped them in their armor. They then made their ship pass as little way, came on a shore again, got their suppers, and waited till night fall, but Penelope lay in their own room up the stairs, unable to eat or drink, and wondering whether her brave son will escape or be overpowered by the weak suitors. Like Linus has caught him to his husband, having her in on every side, she thought in five, till she sank into a slumber and lay on her bed, wrapped a thought in motion. Then a female thought of her of another matter made a vision in the likeness of Penelope's sister, of the daughter of Hippurus, who had married a human and lived in Pharaoh. She told her vision to go to the house of Odysseus and make Penelope leave off her crime. So it came to her by the room of the whole fruit, which the thong went for falling the door to, and it hovered over her head, saying, You are asleep, Penelope, the gods who live at ease will not suffer you to leave and be so sad. Her son has done them no wrong, so he will yet come back to you. Penelope, who was sleeping, sweetly at the gates of Streamline, answered, Sister, why have you come here? You do not know very often that I suppose it is because you live such a long way off. Am I then to leave off crying, refrain from all the sad thoughts that torture me? I have lost my brave and my heart husband, who had heavy good quality under heaven, and whose name was great over all hell as a milk or boost. And now my darling son had gone off board of ship, a foolish fellow who has never been used to roughing it, nor to going about all the islands of men. I
Then the vision said, and take heart and be not so dismayed. There is one gone before him, whom many a man would be glad enough to have stand by his side. I mean, Athena, it is she who has compassion upon you, and who has sent me to bear you his message. Then said Penelope, if you are a god or have been sent here by divine commission, tell me also about the other unhappy ones he's still alive, or is he already dead in the house of Hades? And the vision said, I shall not tell you for certain whether he's alive or dead, and there is no use in idle conversation. Then it vanished through the thong, Paul, the door, and the head, into the air. But Penelope rose from her sleep, refreshed and comfort, and so vivid had been her dream. Meantime, the suitors went on board and sailed their ways over the sea, intended on murdering some mafias. Now there's a rocky islet called Asterius, of no great size, and the channel became Ithaca and Sam, there is a harbor on either side where she can lie. Here, then, the Phrygians place themselves in ambush.